world as we knew it began to change in the early months of 2020. The COVID-19 pandemic, potentially one of the most significant disasters in modern history, began when the first cases of a previously unknown virus were reported. COVID-19, an infectious disease caused by severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2 or SARS-CoV-2, spread rapidly around the globe. By 11th of March 2020, it was declared a controllable pandemic. We have therefore made the assessment that COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. As cases and related deaths skyrocketed, images of emptied cities and mask-wearing citizens filled the news. The pandemic has severely affected countries. Many healthcare systems have reached the point of exhaustion. An avalanche of cases combined with aging infrastructure and a shortage of healthcare professionals have overburdened the healthcare system in most countries. In countries with underfunded public health sectors, COVID-19 has led to widespread turmoil and undermined the future robustness of the health system. Healthcare infrastructure has been subjected to unparalleled stresses. Supply chains have been overwhelmed. Production and flow of medical goods from manufacturer to service provider and patient have also been interrupted. COVID-19 has been a pivotal moment in many ways. As the world responds to the pandemic, with many countries starting to vaccinate their populations, it is time to take stock and action. Knowledge and capacity of frontline workers and health responders on prevention needs to be built. We need to hasten our efforts to build resilient health and supply chain systems that protect the world's most vulnerable and ensure that effective and affordable solutions are available to everyone. Dear all, I have the pleasure to moderate this important session that focuses on the implications of the COVID-19 pandemics for the future of global health infrastructure and their resilience. As seen in the video, COVID-19 has dramatically changed the way we live and function as a society. We have lost friends and relatives. We have experienced, we have supported, and we have seen people battling with the infection. The pandemic has empty street and has overburdened hospitals. It has affected not only health facilities and services, but also healthcare supply chains. National lockdown and disruption in means of transport have severely affected global supply. We've also seen that risk and disasters do not come one at a time. Somalia, for example, in 2020 was hit hard by a triple threat disaster that included the biological hazards of COVID-19 in a fragile health system, a locust plague affecting the food production, and flooding, oversaturating and damaging critical infrastructure such as healthcare facilities. The Somalia example is not one on its own. COVID-19 tests our health infrastructure, while tropical tripod cyclones in Vanuatu Fiji and Tonga, flooding and landslide in East Africa, typhoons in Indonesia, earthquake in Croatia, Turkey and Greece, powered outage in Texas, shape the reality that disaster risks do not come in isolation, but are present in a combined cascading and systemic manner. That said, some positive trends can be seen. A number of countries have turned their attention to the need to revise national legislation on health infrastructure and public health planning. For instance, the government of Tunisia has placed the healthcare sector as a priority in the 2020 disaster reduction strategy, and the construction of several new hospitals across the countries have been planned. 
In Thailand, accessibility to healthcare services have been increased through focusing on developing good district health system and rural infrastructure and focusing on the poorest part of society. The question emerging is how do we identify a roadmap for, for realizing a resilient, accessible, inclusive, and affordable health and supply chain system for all. How to address the existing issues and turn them into opportunity so that the plan and future investments truly ensure the resilience of our infrastructure and services and do not contribute to the creation of instead creating new risk. This is what we are going to be discussing in our session today. And it is now a great pleasure for me to give the floor to Dr. Vijay Raghavan, Principal Scientific Advisor to the Government of India, to give his keynote address. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Alberto, um, Mr. Kamal Kishore, and all colleagues here. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here today. Uh, to put it very mildly, we are going through rather interesting times. Uh, and these are times which we wouldn't have wished on anyone or on ourselves. Um, how did this come about and where do we go from here? And the pandemic has been an extraordinary lesson. Uh, spillovers, the way in which diseases in other animals spill over to humans have been known for a long, long time. And epidemics and pandemics have decided the fate of human history extraordinarily. Uh, you know, it is not the elephant which has just, uh, decided the outcomes of many wars, but the mosquito. Uh, and that's something which we must remember as we go ahead. While spillovers have happened historically, many, many times, and that we had pandemics, there is a great likelihood that we are going to see many more pandemics and of very different kinds. And the reason for that is a simple one. All life is the product of evolution by natural selection, and the interactions of different life forms to cause disease is also such a product. When diseases happen and spread, these are very unusual events. And Theodosius Dobzhansky, the famous evolutionary biologist many, many decades ago said that given enough time, an event, even if it's of low probability, will happen. And that's what has happened in tens and hundreds of millions of years. We are the products of such low probability event as are viruses, bacteria, plants, and so on. But what we have done through human effort is to transform this huge timeline into a compressed spatial domain. So what happens in hundreds of millions of years now happens in space in a very short time. And the reason for that is the huge crowding of our urban environments, the close proximity of different kinds of life forms, the way we have changed our environment in multiple ways. So here are some examples. Wet markets are the traditional source of pandemics, and therefore viral spillovers have often focused on those. But my favorite story is one of some years ago in Kazakhstan, where the saiga antelope suddenly saw a huge number of deaths. And that was due to a commensal bacteria, which because of a 1.5 degree increase in summer temperature, became invasive and you know, caused sepsis. So the enemy, as it were, is right amongst us. Changes in temperature, crowding, garbage dumps in cities, can dramatically change the properties of different life forms so that they become invasive. So the potential for pandemics is right around us. It's not just in you know, sanitationally uh, compromised urban environments where this is a problem. When we clean up our cities, we also cause sometimes the spread of disease, of zoonotic diseases. Lyme disease in Long Island is caused by converting forest areas into tennis courts removing, you know, uh, intermediaries in the transmission of the disease and allowing the disease to jump from deer to human uh, or from rodents to human directly. Uh, so again, it's not a simple answer that we need to do something or something else. It requires a great understanding of the ecosystem. So what do we do? 
So we go on how do, how do things happen? They will happen more, they'll happen in more complex ways. How do we preempt and how do we reimagine health? One of the points which we need to do is to embark for resilient infrastructure, a deep understanding of ecosystems, as opposed to being responsive, also being preemptive. And this is going to be true of how we make our buildings, our roads, our environments, and deal with life around us, right from the microbiome to large animals uh, and plants. How do we react? We must distinguish between preparedness and response. In terms of preparedness, the West was extraordinarily prepared for a pandemic. They could send you know, health workers anywhere in the world and stop any pandemic originating elsewhere. But once a pandemic broke out, uh, which was you know, um, just truly uh, all over the place, the Western health systems were very much challenged, just as much as other health systems were. So we must distinguish between preparedness and response and ensure that response is truly calibrated, dynamic, and nimble. Then we need to respond early. You know, there's a danger in overreacting, but overreacting is something which is feasible very early. You cannot overreact later on, it's just reaction. And therefore, calibrating reaction very early in a proper way, communicated to people so they don't panic, is very important. And therefore, there, multiple other tools come into place. What are the tools? We need to have tools which react rapidly, so we need a rapid time scale of solutions. Scientific solutions usually come in the years, industrial solutions come in quarters, and solutions for governments and politicians come by Friday evening. So we need to have a way by which these three different trains of solutions communicate with each other and exchange material at high speed. That's very feasible. So intermediaries who flit around between these three trains and transfer information and solutions are needed. We cannot have them meeting at some stations periodically by chance. So this is a very, very important lesson we have learned. Uh, then, Collaborations are very important. The pandemic showed how we can jump together and collaborate in a crisis. So we need to be also able to prevent crisis through collaboration. That's not easy. That requires a different imagination of intellectual property, of global collaboration, and understanding that investing in seat belts and airbags is useful even before we have an accident and you can't you know, get them in place at the time of accident. So this requires money, this requires paying for the future, this requires a synergy between economics, politics, and science. And that's very important. The digital world is upon us, and digital diagnostics, digital tools, digital vaccination effectively, testing, tracking can be done for any disease. This needs to be second nature and spread enormously rapidly. In the absence of knowledge of what a disease is, what its treatment is, digital methods of surveillance, uh, physical methods, non-pharmaceutical methods of protection, such as next generation masks, which can filter out at high level for respiratory diseases, for example. All of that should be available very fast so that they can go boom and cut disease spread at the early stages. Human resources for all this are going to be very important. Training on a large scale uh, should be second nature in a variety of programs, uh, as also rehearsals for events and various kinds of crises. In all of this, governance is critically important. Governance should be enabled so that they, across all political parties, across all governments, there is a consensus that this is an area where we are protecting humanity, and therefore this is not something where we can cut corners or have a view that you know, we can protect ourselves without protecting everyone else. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Raghavan. I think you really provided a, an extremely comprehensive overview from the perspective in terms of potential of pandemics, the need to understand the ecosystem, which is so fundamental, but also looking at the solution, the importance of communication, collaboration, human resources, and the last point you mentioned in terms of governance. Governance, it is indeed a fundamental enabler to the resilience of, of our society. Thank you very much for this. Um, now I have uh, the pleasure to move to our panelists today. 
We have a diverse group of experts from whom we will hear about their experience on the ground in particular. We have Dr. Kyla Lazarson, Deputy Director, Infectious Diseases, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, will share an insight from the vaccine rollout process in India. We have Dr. Garmalia Mentor William, Haiti representative of the Geohazards International, that will share the impact of other disasters on health infrastructure. And Mr. Hans Peter Turfers, the director of the International Programs UPS Foundation, that will take us through the supply chain system of delivering the vaccine. Last but not least, we will hear a special address by Ms. Laurel Anders Brown, director and producer, who will bring to the fora the important topic of the role of media in raising awareness and enhancing public understanding towards the creation of positive social change in all areas of global health. So without any further ado, I will now give the floor to Dr. Kyla Lazarson. Great, <clears throat> thank you very much. And thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak. Um, I'm talking some, about something slightly different than what you uh, described because I'm gonna um, speak a little bit about kind of the entire COVID-19 response, which includes right now the vaccine rollout, but some of the other work that builds on um, uh, Professor Raghavan's uh, discussion and the ecosystem and some of the ways in which we worked closely with the government to, to, to build on some of those ideas uh, in real time and it, ways in which we're thinking about those uh, areas to go forward in terms of pandemic preparedness. So uh, we were able to collaborate uh, with the government at the national level and then at two states, Bihar and UP, the, some of the largest states in India, uh, and then um, kind of with the kind of civil society. So I just wanted to just take a couple minutes to describe that. So at the, um, at the state level, we uh, worked with uh, the facilities and to ensure the facilities were scaled up for COVID-19 uh, in terms of all the supplies, but also beds, also some renovation of facilities. We uh, supported the increase in testing capacity and uh, the ways in which the government and ICMR in particular scaled at a phenomenal scale of testing capacity. And also worked with the incident management response and surveillance systems in the states to really build digital systems and to really ensure uh, data was moving quickly uh, and supported some of those efforts. We also uh, supported healthcare worker training, um, the women's groups training, the house to house training, looking for symptomatic individuals and testing. Uh, and uh, very importantly, behavioral change, communication, learning from the community, what were the questions, turning that right around into co communication messages that could go out quickly uh, to ensure that uh, knowledge was shared as fast as possible with so many questions that the community had. When we moved to the national level, we supported some of the national kind of strategic thinking and uh, on testing, testing scale up and rollout procurement and supply tracking, especially in some of the early days. Um, research and development, we've been working closely on issues around vaccine and diagnostics, both um, in India, but globally as well. Uh, and the digital and ICT, it's such an important area. And we've learned so much from COVID and how to move data and how to move it quickly and how to make that sustainable. And then working with the private sector, what are the parameters around that and how to uh, ensure that that works well. We also have in our office uh, individuals working in the agricultural sector. So there was a whole lot of effort around agriculture and getting in some of the issues that were just mentioned around zoonotic disease and how to strengthen One Health. Some of those issues came up as part of COVID. Also in sanitation, we worked a lot in the urban environments, the kind of urban densely populated areas, realizing those were unique areas for COVID and how they interface with some of the wash and sanitation work. Uh, and we also uh, spent time on evidence generation, telephone surveys, and that sort of thing that we supported to very quickly turn around information so that we could learn and apply and, and share those uh, findings as quickly as possible. And then we also worked on essential services, how to keep tuberculosis notification going, how to keep vector-borne disease, insect, insecticide residual spraying going, and how to uh, ensure nutrition kept going, and, and the financial services for the poor, and supporting whatever ways in which um, 
you know, distributions were going out to the population to help and the kind of economic uh, hardships that were uh, faced by everybody. Um, and then one of our biggest areas that we supported was communication. All of the community engagement, work on stigma, work on spitting, work on um, the myth of COVID. And we uh, supported the government in creation of a, of a repository that all NGOs could use uh, and, and others to help share that information. So I know I'm running out of time, but I just wanted to share all that because those kinds of connections um, were great learning for all of us and hopefully learnings we can take forward together with the government, with partners to think about how, uh, how pandemic preparedness can be strengthened, but we really learned so much within India by the government response. And uh, it was really a privilege to support that and uh, to learn from that. I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you very much, Kaila, for this uh, comprehensive overview that as you correctly pointed out, it goes very much beyond the simple vaccination campaign. And uh, really a lot of um, uh, emphasis and, uh, and added value that you put forward in terms of uh, highlighting the relevance of partnership and communication but also the important work uh, in terms of reaching out to the community and to consider the local context. Very much appreciated. Now, I would like to give the floor to the second speaker, which is uh, Dr. Garmaglia Mentor-Williams, the IET representative. Dr. Garmiglia, the floor is yours. Everyone, can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Um, uh, I am Gaumalia Mentor, country representative of Geohazard International in Haiti. Uh, we have a small team working across Haiti, enhancing community capacities in disaster risk reduction. Uh, we have been leading efforts uh, for diverse disasters, documenting lessons learned from each and advocating for hospital resilience for several years. However, uh, not much attention has been uh, paid to the fact to that Haiti, a small uh, island developing country, uh, is prone to earthquakes, hurricanes, and the effects of climate change. We have been hit by major earthquakes and hurricanes and will continue to do so. Uh, almost 50 healthcare centers were severely damaged uh, in the aftermath of the 2010 earthquake, and several more uh, were left dysfunctional uh, in a magnitude six earthquake in 2018. Uh, that was taken by that picture uh, was taken uh, by, by our team uh, doing hospital reconnaissance, uh, and on the right is when flood affects hospital in Southern Haiti, almost in, rainy, in every rainy season. Uh, keeping hospitals safe uh, is not enough. If the power, the water supply and medical gas uh, are knocked off. Uh, so for a hospital to remain functional, of course, the building has to remain safe. The staff has to be prepared and ready. Supplies should be available and medical equipment such as autoclaves and imaging equipment have all to be functioning. Then the last component in, in the chart uh, is to keep communications working to ensure that disaster management plan and the network with the entire health systems works. Having local backup for utilities is so important. COVID has not luckily affected any of the infrastructure other than in overwhelming hospitals, but where concurrent hazards have happened, the downtime of infrastructure has been affected by COVID consideration. In closing, to keep the health infrastructure functional in SEED's nation, it is important to improve resilience in our healthcare facilities in strengthening buildings, equipment, and having local backup for utility services. Also, we need to take local for basic healthcare materials and equipment so that we are self-reliant, especially during pandemics where we cannot afford to lose time. Uh, towards self-resilience nation, or as you say in India, 
Atma Nirbha. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karmalia. There was um, a very interesting presentation and thank you in particular for clearly highlighting the importance of uh, reducing the risk of disasters and the need really to look at the full pictures in terms of uh, multi-hazards as a mean to maintain functional health and medical service. It will not stand on their own. It needs to be an overall approach. This is very much appreciated. And now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Toffel for its overall presentation from UPS Foundation. Over to you. Thank, thanks a lot, Paula. Um, uh, good morning, good afternoon. I'm, um, it's a pleasure to discuss with you resilient uh, health infrastructure and how to get there. So I think uh, COVID, of course, is one topic, but um, if we are talking about healthcare infrastructure in general, we have to go beyond COVID. Um, and that's what I would like to talk about. First of all, what have we done so far uh, in order to support um, resilient infrastructure, healthcare infrastructure, uh, what kind of challenging challenges are causing obstacles and uh, last but not least, what needs to be done uh, and can be done actually taken, of course, into account where we are right now with the situation <clears throat> that we are facing. So um, what UPS does is the first thing I would like to talk about. So I'm with the UPS Foundation, the philanthropic arm of UPS. Uh, but the Foundation and UPS Corporation are helping to build resilience in complementing ways somehow. You see it on the slide. Um, I have, uh, I have uh, uh, pictured both ways. So um, um, on one hand, uh, there were situations in the past as Ebola in 2015, but past situations were not as complex as COVID is today. So um, there is a certain infrastructure as well for vaccination in many countries, thanks to partners like Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, for instance, and Gavi and others, but we are not sure whether they sustain and are suited to be the future standard. Um, what the foundation has done is to commit to facilitate to equitable worldwide vaccine deliveries. This includes, of course, doses, but as well commodities supporting the process, such as syringes. You see some details at the slide. Um, and we have run pilots um, in low and middle income countries, such as Uganda, Rwanda, Ghana, and others to learn about infrastructure and needs. In parallel, UPS Healthcare works with producers of vaccinations to adapt to their needs for their products and to guarantee seamless delivery towards the final vaccination process. Again, the slideshow relevant, shows relevant products for cold chain, for control, and for management that we think that are relevant. In combination, we learned from pilots to run daily operations smoothly and detected gaps um, which are mainly in accurate last mile cold chains, ordering processes and controlled and measurable delivery quality safeguarded by control systems and quality and tracking. Um, the slide before, please, if I might ask you, so we are on the third already. Um, the, the, the slide I'm referring to um, right now is uh, showing a little bit of the co complexity of uh, supply chains. So, and that is the challenge for resilience. We basically have three processes. Thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, first, um, of course, besides financing, which is an issue, but um, we basically have the process of sourcing and production, in some cases, um, as well defined transport and delivery routes. Um, even though healthcare does not necessarily mean cold chain, ambient temperature is exceeded in a lot of countries permanently. And that means, again, temperature control has to be taken into account. Um, the next point, the next phase is transport and warehousing, um, a temperature and a cost issue. Cold chain, of course, is a game changer and time sensitivity is driving up costs, thus meaning we should have sophisticated supply chains with control towers and supply chain planning systems in place to drive down costs and make healthcare systems affordable. Finally, there is intermediate storage in very differently built systems in country and last mile, especially again on the cold chain, uh, causing a lot of preparation, knowledge, and control. For instance, we work with UNICEF on a stock management tool, and the process already took four years, which is too long. We need to be faster. Complexity derives from connecting the dots and build supply chains aligned with producers, transport companies, and existing infrastructures. There are assessment tools available. For instance, UNICEF and WHO provided planning tools 
Um, there's an entire booklet um, that you, that that, uh, that uh, uh, experts can uh, get from the internet. However, we know little currently about the preparedness of infrastructures for professional healthcare systems solutions. And I'm talking about something that is beyond COVID. So coming to see what needs to be done. Next slide, please. Um, well, the current challenge for healthcare systems might offer opportunities as well. We see um, there's a lot of exchange and seminars to offer learnings to experts in country in the current situation. Uh, like UNDRR and other UN organizations offered regular webinars on best practices in different countries to help others replicating successful models. This needs to be continued and extended as well on healthcare systems overall, not only for COVID. Successful models, best practices offer as well insights into a major issue for healthcare systems, and this is, this is costs. For a supply chain, it is important to provide risk modeling and have a clear validation on what is achievable based on the standards that are set. The slideshow uh, shows a model which we are using and have used for a last mile approach in a low middle, um, uh, middle income countries in the past months. So the risk modeling helps to define costs on defined quality. And this is what we need to know uh, if not only discussing future health infrastructures, but build them eventually. And the current, uh, the current crisis can be a stress test for that. Thanks a lot for listening. Thank you very much, Hans-Peter, for this um, overview, revealing to us the complexity of the supply chain and the related challenges, but also for clearly highlighting what is needed to bridge the existing gaps and the reference you made to learning and knowledge exchanges, best practices and risk modeling and validation are uh, clearly um, a way to ensure that this important role in terms of supply chain will move ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to remind actually our participants to the session that if time allows, we're going to have the opportunity of an interactive Q&A with our presenters today. So please do not hesitate to put any questions through the chat so that we can hear from them, from their experience based on your consideration. And with this, I would like now to pass the floor to Ms. Laurel Anders-Brown. Laurel, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Paola. At the beginning of 2014, I was in Liberia and Sierra Leone, filming just before the height of the spread of Ebola. Five years later, I went back to Liberia um, to make an interactive film that would allow audiences to follow and make choices volunteers did at that time and to live out the consequences of them throughout the film. The first choice that is presented in the film is offered when a government announcement is made, warning people of the new virus of Ebola, to not eat bats, which is a very common meal for many in the country that may carry the virus, and to keep distance from each other, and especially anyone who is infected. I made this, I had this be the first choice within the film um, based on the interviews that I did with Liberians who lived through it, because overwhelmingly their initial reaction to that news, no matter who I asked, was that it was fake. It was the government trying to control them because they couldn't see the virus like they could see the civil war that many of them had lived through. So why would it be so bad? I can't tell you how many times in the last year I have not been surprised by the pushback, disbelief, and misunderstanding of the media messaging for COVID-19 because of my work on that film. And because as humans, we can choose not to believe in as many things as we choose to believe in. It doesn't matter if it goes against government or science advice or any other credible source, it is still our choice to believe, and we're learning that that is just as powerful. Something else I can believe to be just as powerful is a good story. And that is my case as a documentary filmmaker, I'd say a good factual story. One that suspends our disbelief, but also finds a way of making us believe in something we may not have been willing to do so before. In 2016, I directed and produced my first full-length documentary film, The Checklist Effect. It's based on Dr. Atul Gawande's book and his work about implementing WHO surgical safety checklist. 
The concept behind the checklist is simple. A surgical team does a standard checklist of basic questions before an operation. What's new about this? Why in the evolution of medicine did this only come into existence in 2009? Because in the past, surgeons didn't believe in it. They believed their extensive training and title meant the burden of the entire procedure was on them and that a piece of paper wasn't going to make a difference in how well they performed the operation. Almost godlike. I can say this all safe in the knowledge that my partner is a surgeon who at times, even after having done so much work with the checklist, still has that same godlike mentality. Uh, in one of the screenings of that documentary at King's College London, I sat very quietly in the back and overheard two surgeons. One of them was from Cameroon and one was from Southeast Asia in front of me whispering, the checklist. Yeah, we tried that, it didn't work. Tough audience, I thought, but by the end of the film, I heard them whisper, huh, maybe we should try it again. I, I didn't look at it that way before. I will share they were also a bit more relieved with their quiet commentary after I stood up and began the post-screening discussion. The film has been screened at over a dozen festivals, hundreds of medical schools, and broadcast internationally. And it's been able to do what one speech at one conference cannot do, and that is cross borders to improve global collaboration and inspire people on the ground to create change from within, within their own surgical systems and infrastructure in whatever way they see possible. And all because of just throwing out some numbers like 25% reduced deaths and 40% reduced morbidity, we put a face to it, and more importantly, a relatable story. But just as storytelling in global health can inspire and support people to believe, a well-constructed story can also cause disbelief. During COVID-19, nothing has been more powerful than people picking up their own media devices and sharing their beliefs, whether those stories be true or not. I believe the best way to approach this is to create more factual content worth believing in. And therefore, we need more filmmakers, more photographers, writers, and visual storytellers. But what we also need is financial support from the organizations that want us to share these stories. Just as I will encourage any participants here today to budget money for visual storytelling in any communications plan, I will also encourage inspiring filmmakers to make the most of this moment in history. There are positives to this pandemic. Last year, I was able to attend the virtual version of Cannes and it had direct access to a multitude of producers that I might not have ever been able to meet at the real life festival. Other organizations I'm a member of like Women in Film and the Frontline Club have been online now for more than a year and offering so many workshop opportunities and networking that again, you could be anywhere in the world and participate in. There's some great funds that can support independent producers like the Wickers, who are currently making an audio documentary with the finalist prize that I won. So it is possible to reach and have this access that we never had before. We all came into this pandemic together but we're all exiting it differently. And even once we do exit and are able to see the world again for ourselves, we still need to bring stories across borders. We can't fight misinformation alone. We need an army of as many visual storytellers and filmmakers as possible to continue to seek the truth and create positive behavior change as a direct impact of their work. But just because it's true does not mean it's free. Thank you. Laurel, really, thank you very much for this uh, for these words. Um, you took me back to my first experience in Djibouti, where actually at the time I was working on the Millennium Development Goals, and I was working with artists, precisely as you said, uh, putting a face towards putting a face to a good story, and also to to share some facts and figures. And to me, it was an extremely enriching experience. So your words are very welcome and very much needed. Media plays an important role in increasing knowledge sharing and education in contemporary times. And I think very often we leave this sort of fundamental communication as the last step, as you said, if budget allows it. But uh, this pandemic as an example touches everyone, every human being. And this is why it's so fundamentally important to find the right channel to communicate 
properly and with a good story, these important facts and figures that are going to be saving their life and their society. So thank you very much, Laura, for this. Much appreciated. And now with this, I would like to go back to each of the speakers that have um, really taken the time to take us through some initial considerations on their areas of engagement. And I would like to start with uh, Kyla. Kyla, can you elaborate a little bit more on how can philanthropic organizations engage with the public sector to ensure that a systemic approach in design and delivery of healthcare infrastructure and its dependencies? And what are the challenges to this? Great, thank you. Um, I just, I love that communication uh, and media uh, story and I just couldn't, I couldn't agree more how important that is. Um, so in terms of sort of uh, philanthropic kind of partnership, uh, you know, the first thing really that is the most important is really kind of uh, aligning with the government or the key stakeholder on the overall partnership and the engagement. So what are the goals? What are the outcomes? What are the outputs that we uh, wish to, to work on together? And then to take kind of a situation analysis, almost a diagnostic to see, you know, what are the systemic barriers um, that are leading to poor health outcomes or whatever uh, issue that we're addressing. Um, and that might be geographic, it might be transport constraints, it may be limited access to information or uh, health practices, information about health practices, um, shortfall of public health facilities, uh, or shortfall of quality workforce, um, maybe a lack of data or limited data. So after that kind of situation analysis and in partnership with the government or, or the key stakeholder or both to kind of work on the interventions together um, and to figure out how to look at a system strengthening approach um, versus uh, you know, gap filling. So kind of a, a strengthening through TA, um, deployment of workforce, training, um, building capacity, uh, and then in terms of data, building, helping to build dashboards and, and use of the data, enabling scale and systems is really what we're trying to do um, and increasing accountability uh, and uh, working on kind of all of those different areas, building that momentum together to really build up kind of a system and a plan um, together, uh, nudging, um, and shifting from sort of service coverage to a, really a systems ecosystem. Um, some of the challenges are uh, that there is a tendency to do gap filling. And so trying to make sure that that is not, I mean, that may be how it starts, but how to kind of move away from that to more capacity building, um, to not have a siloed approach. We tend to have siloed approaches, but to really focus on integration across health, nutrition, sanitation, et cetera. Um, to bring in innovation. Sometimes that's hard to do, but that's really important. Uh, and to make sure that our ideas and our plans percolate from the national level down to the state, like the district and the block and the village, so that those uh, system changes are really kind of embedded and sustained. So that's sort of a model that we work with, uh, but always in partnership uh, with the government. I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you very much, Kaila. And I would like now to quickly go to Dr. Garmalia. And uh, Dr. Garmalia, what do you think are the challenges of uh, small island development states in keeping health facilities functional during disastrous events? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I think this is just a matter of making the right investment. Uh, in the safety of health infrastructure, both new and old. Uh, this will include setting standards for new investment and ensuring the critical function a move to this newer building. Uh, in Haiti, we have a large stock of existing health, health infrastructure. So it is important to prioritize this based on critical function. So we need to carry out detailed assessment of these before we to feeding them if, if needed. And also we can use uh, the excellent tools uh, uh, that is uh, made by w WHO 
which is the Global Hospital Safety Index, uh, which give a clear picture of structural, non-structural aspect, including UDMD. Uh, in fact, uh, GHI has already field tested uh, this tool uh, in, in Seeds Nation, uh, such as Solomon Island. Um, also, it comes down to proactive leadership, governance, uh, taking informed decision towards plan adaptation uh, and mitigation measures. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gamalia. Very much appreciated. And Hans Peter, a follow up question for you. What are the opportunities for innovations in logistics sectors to strengthen resilience of health infrastructure and supply chain systems? Uh, as uh, thank I I'm sorry. Thank, thanks, Paul. Sorry. Thanks, Paula. Uh, I think there are many. I mean, we have uh, we have we have a lot tested in the past years, um, which can be used as well for uh, strengthening healthcare systems for sure. So um, let me point on on some things here uh, very quickly. So, for instance, uh, UPS has a long history. Um, in uh, operational improvements, we used a system that is called some years ago already. We use a system that is called Orion, uh, which is basically a route, route, a route planning system um, that enables um, the driver to make delivery decisions. Um, but uh, in parallel, it controls costs, it avoids miles and fuel, and therefore helps to protect the environment. We are not selling Orion, but I just want to point on that. So there are many of those route planning systems available, and they should be used, especially when we are thinking about last mile uh, last mile systems in uh, in healthcare strengthening. Second point, uh, and that goes in line with the first one, quality monitoring. We have um, with a with a partner Gavi and others, we have uh, invested into a uh, into a pilot a cold chain delivery network in Uganda, for instance, uh, where we uh, resupplied vaccines and other commodities. Um, that was last year. And so um, we had we had to think about coaching vehicles, about storage, about packaging, and then uh, we had a cell phone application as well that was linking together order placement, shipment status, uh, in transit visibility, and then um, as well the the, the possibility um, to um, to define um, the, the the last mile. Um, um, the, the last mile situation a little bit in more details. Don't want to go too deep into that, but all of that was easy. So it wasn't a complicated solution. It was no heavy investment necessary because it was cell phone based. But uh, the quality, the quality of delivery, which is relevant, especially for vaccines, has reached um, new levels. So never, never have been reached before in that country. So we have to plan better and monitor quality with systems that are long established for commercial shipments. Um, and uh, we have to really look into that um, as, uh, as, uh, as the, the patient is the customer. So unfortunately, the patient doesn't have too many choices. So at the end of the day, he needs to get what he, what he has. And so therefore, we have to be, to be better in that regard uh, if we are building um, systems. Um, uh, uh, the, the last thing is uh, use all modes of transport and be open for solutions. So, for instance, drones, we started working with drones um, in uh, clinic environments, for instance. So they are tested already in a commercial environment and they are working. But um, they can as well disrupt on how humanitarian health aid is being provided. For instance, uh, uh, drones can reach isolated communities to increase testing, vaccination, contactless delivery. That means minimizing the contact and virus transmission, faster deliveries. So we can, rather than having hours by car or van, we can have minutes. We can overcome logistical in-country constraints due to lockdowns as well due to weather. And then uh, have same level of testing confidence in rural areas and in cities. So there are a lot of advantages going with that. And this is only related to COVID. We can imagine more opportunities as well beyond the crisis. We have proven concepts with partners like Zipline, Gavi and others in Rwanda, in Ghana, and we are currently working on more progressive concepts with a partner called Wingcopter, a German drone producer, where we try to find the right country or countries for pilots. Beyond products, 
just want to uh, make that point on service innovations as well. And um, there's this marketplace, and it's going with CDRI, where we, together with an implementing partner, IDEMA, present an innovative concept called Resilience in the Box, which is built especially for small and medium-sized enterprises. So if you have time, maybe you have a chance to uh, look into that. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Hans Peter. And now over to Laurel. Uh, Laurel, how can video storytelling help advance policy agenda across border to improve global collaboration? Thank you, Paolo. That's a great question. Um, as we know, with any kind of policies that exist, it requires a lot of different parties um, and, and people to come together and agree on something. Everyone can have different life experiences and impressions of looking at the data and the facts and the research, or even like a simple photograph. They can approach those all differently. So the nice thing about storytelling visually, um, especially in motion picture storytelling, is that it can, it can present a perspective all together to one group of people, one audience, that they can hopefully take away um, the same takeaway points all at once and can kind of come to those conclusions when it comes to making big decisions about policies and information and, and understanding um, the situation, especially protracted crises. Um, I'm thinking of uh, when I was in Bangladesh um, and on a trip with um, the executive director of UNFPA, we were about to go to Cox's Bazaar. I'd already been filming there and working on a documentary for over a month with them. And um, was in the final edit stages of it. And the night before we went to fly there, she sent me a message um, on Twitter and asked if she could get a copy of the film before we flew. So, you know, we coordinate all these big field meetings um, for, you know, important people to be able to see what's the work that's happening on the ground. But even then, sometimes they still want a different perspective, you know, one that they won't get to see when they're there. And I think that that's something that visual storytelling can do and can kind of bring people together to see and, and appreciate and understand a, a different perspective than one that they might have had, even if they had the opportunity to go into the field or to go to some of these places um, and to understand the personal stories and, and issues that can happen with these bigger health crises. So um, I think that's what visual storytelling can do. It can just open and broaden our, our horizons and give us um, a different point of view that we might not have been able to have before. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laurel. And thanks to all of you for sharing your experience, your view, and also highlighting your way forward. I now would like to pass the floor to Dr. Ravagan for some reflections that uh, you have considered emerging from uh, this very enriching debate and exchanges we just had. Um, thank you very much, Paolo. Um, this has a, been a very, very important learning experience. Uh, let me start with what Ms. Laurel um, Anders uh, Brown said. Uh, you know, at the heart of everything today uh, is communication. And this is an enormous challenge in the face of us being swamped by communication. So it's not that there's a shortage of communication, there's extraordinary volume of communication. And in that, what is the way by which, you know, relevant, correct messages get across and are accepted? So it's not just, you know, thrusting down facts. It's about listening as well as, you know, telling. And this is a very, very big challenge for science. Uh, for many, many decades, scientists were used to telling people what's good for them and that being accepted readily. Then we moved to a situation where we explained downwards. Today, we have to communicate both ways, and that's a big change. So that's something which is a very important learning experience. I was very pleased to see uh, Kyla uh, from the Gates Foundation talk about capacity building. And that, to me, is a very, very valuable uh, move on philanthropies to move from you know, solving the problem immediately by getting the troops in and helping in every possible way to actually collaborating, participating, and building capacity based on the demands of peoples all over the world so that you know solutions are uh, asked for bottom up rather than thrust top down. This is a very valuable uh, change. Uh, uh, we also learned uh, from Garmiala Mentor William 
about the role of government, and that should not be underestimated. Given the diversity of views, interests, uh, you know, capacities, government is the collaborating force, the, the, the force which gets everyone together and distills and takes a viewpoint. That capacity is what people trust government. Otherwise, to lay out a whole range of possibilities and probabilities and tell people this is how the complexity is can be overwhelming. Uh, governments as representatives of people distill and communicate decisions in a manner which is trusted. So therefore, government and people interactions are very, very important. Finally, I must um, congratulate Hans-Peter for bringing out the incredible value of uh, digital approaches combined with the physical, the cyber physical, drones and digital, for example, in looking at how one can manage logistics, uh, manage logistics supply chains, and delivery. This is going to be a way of the future, and this is going to be economically viable because it can now be done on scale. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ravagan, for this uh, overview and, and highlight some uh, extremely valuable messages that were shared by the participants. Um, we are now entering uh, the moment of interactive exchanges with the audience. And we have received a number of questions. And I would like to ask all of you as speakers to keep it succinct, but to touch upon uh, one question that, uh, in my view, is extremely important, thinking about the youth. And how would you see the youth getting engaged and step forward in, ter in terms of making our infrastructure more resilient? Over to any of you that wants to grab the floor to start with. Um, I could start. This is Kayla. Um, yes, Kayla. You know, I think uh, we 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 were actually able to um, kind of interact with the youth in uh, Dharavi, in particular, um, in Mumbai, and um, make a kind of a rap video around COVID and uh, it was really well received. Uh, and then in addition, um, for some of the mass campaign work that we were working on, we uh, added a Ludo King, which I guess is a, I don't actually know how you use it, but it's a, an app, a game um, and a uh, video game. And it has a whole mask component module now to it. And it was very popular, tons and tons of youth used it to help you know, kind of think about mask, mask wearing. And I think with mask wearing in particular for COVID, the youth are so important to be using masks, showing everyone that they're using masks. So I think getting the youth involved in messages, disseminating messages um, and um, ensuring the right messages go out uh, and how they go out, I think is essential. So I think the youth have an extremely important role to play in our, in our work. Thank you very much, Kyla. Anybody else that would like to take the floor? In the meantime, while the, the rest of the panelists are, are, um, are considering the youth, let me also say that uh, very often in the past, the youth were considered sort of um, fragile and, and uh, overall a, a group uh, that needed to be protected vis-a-vis -vis disasters. But what we are seeing is that in fact, youth are, are a force. The engagement of youth in our society in terms of resilience infrastructure and overall disaster risk reduction is, is a fundamental one. They are the mover and the shaker of our society. So, Kaila, I could not agree with you more on the relevance of ensuring that youth are part of the pictures, are engaged, but also are the ones that are telling us the story. Going to Laurel and putting the face to the stories, I think youth on television today makes a tremendous sense when they talk about disaster risk reduction and resilience overall. So let me just pass to another question. And again, in a very succinct manner from all of you or who wishes to take the floor, um, what would be for you the one major lessons that you learned from COVID-19 and therefore your way forward in terms of uh, resilience and health infrastructure? Paola? Yes, Hans-Peter. If I may. 
just one remark on the on the first question, if I may, uh, very quickly. I mean, the corporations have one advantage, and that is that they usually work with the, with the youth, as um, especially in case they have diverse workforce, which we have. So that means there are there are, for instance, um, business core groups um, like youth, younger um, younger younger employees who are uh, bringing themselves into processes. And um, if you really think about it, the entire process of digitalization, uh, which Professor Raghavan mentioned uh, earlier, is something where the youth is playing a bigger role than probably the elder, um, as those are the ones that are that have they have been born with with digital equipment, so to speak, and that means as well that uh, that they are the driving force. So that means that those who want to survive in the business processes need to take them into account in any event. And that means as well that uh, that this uh, this knowledge and those processes will flow into anything that is related to healthcare and Brazilian healthcare. Now, on the the one major lesson on COVID, um, um, that's very simple. Um, I mean, the we are we were not prepared for that, even though we did know that since probably five or six years ago, um, as the scientists uh, were already warning that something like that could come. And um, that is my that is that was my major lesson that we had to very quickly adapt um, and picked up on on uh, all of our resources uh, to make sure that uh, that on one hand first of all uh, protective equipment uh, uh, was uh, was shipped into the right direction and then secondly right now we are talking about a massive a massive supply chain um, challenge uh, which could have been done in a different way if if we would have invested more into preparedness and resilience. That's my takeaway. Thank you very much, Hans Peter. Yes, please, Dr. Germania. Yes, thank you. Uh, my two major lesson learned was aware uh, with youth, uh, because we had a project uh, during COVID uh, time in Haiti involving young people. So they were disclosing information to the population in, trans in public transportation and uh, in public markets. And they share uh, audiovisual uh, information uh, and they show also how to people to wear masks. So they were the one bringing the messages to the community. So that was a big impact to, to the people seeing that kids are involved. So the message in, into that is that when kids get, when young people get involved, they are less vulnerable. So through this action, we were reverting uh, the, the, the vulnerability of the young people into strengthening their capacity. And the second um, lesson I had is we need to take local because um, as a seeds, as a third world uh, country, so we had, uh, not enough funds to to order uh, equipment and materials uh, uh, aboard. So uh, when we decided to order, so it took longs, and so it was difficult to get uh, this equipment on time. So when we take local, we hire uh, local iron workers uh, to, to to manufacture beds and. We convert uh, local industries that usually uh, uh, manufacture dresses and stuff. So we, conduct, we convert them into uh, masks and into uh, medical equipment uh, that we need. So it was useful instead of waiting for uh, order uh, that, never, that never come. So I think we need to take local and we need to get young people involved. So that's why in Geohazard, we mostly involve young people in the community to bring messages and, and to strengthen their capability. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gamalia. Um, going through the questions, there is one that is actually again addressed to you, Dr. Gamalia. Uh, it concerns the mental health and the trauma that has been a major challenge during the pandemic. Um, what is, uh, in your view, any best practice for community resilience and confidence, confidence building vis-a-vis -vis this, uh, this important aspect, which is mental health? Um, in Haiti, uh, we have a major issue with uh, mental health. Uh, 
because this is not a priority for the government and the population is not well aware of of the need uh, of mental health. Because uh, sincerely, if you tell someone to go see a psychologist or a, a psychiatrist, so they might think that you think they are mentally ill. So people do not really know the need uh, of, of mental health. So uh, we had also uh, healthcare workers, um, the first uh, to intervene, they were, were, they were not worried about their mental health also. So we realized at the end, they were all uh, crashed down. So they were not uh, prepared to serve as they are not uh, ready for that. So they were also very affected by, by the situation, knowing that we do not have enough equipment. We do not have enough words, enough uh, uh, materials to take care uh, of, of the patient uh, that might come. So we were so afraid of surge capacity that uh, most of the doctors or healthcare, other healthcare workers were very, very, very worried and very stressed. So I think uh, the government should uh, make it a priority. And even though they open hotline for people to call, but as people are not really educated, so they, they did not use it. So I think uh, there is a need in Haiti uh, to prioritize education in terms of mental health and also uh, to take good care of first responders uh, because they need this support. And, and also uh, young people need psycho, uh, social uh, support also. So I think this is one we need to, to enhance, to work on, on in Haiti. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Garmaya. And I think uh, we need to, to move towards the, the closing of, uh, of this session. So we will stop with the interactive part. And um, as ever, it is um, very complex and at the same time, very important to try to reflect on some of the key elements that have emerged today. I think all of us and all of you as touched upon the importance of governance. Coming from the disaster risk reduction, the Sendai Framework for Action points out that good governance requires clear vision, plans, and coordination across sectors with full participation of uh, stakeholders. And I think overall countries are encouraged to incorporate infrastructure resilience in their national and local disaster risk reduction strategies. I think we touch upon the importance of infrastructure regulation, that it needs to be strengthened, the relevance of mechanisms such as new law and public policy, which prevent the creation of new risk, but also reduces existing risk. And of course, in line with this, the role of the supply chain needs, that needs to be recognized. And uh, the sector needs, needs per se to become part of the overall resilient efforts. We need to stress the robustness of our national and local engagement, and we need to start thinking resilience. And when we think resilience, then we move indeed towards the faces of the people and the importance of the messages. You have been highlighting the importance of enhancing knowledge and building capacity. Certainly, this is an area where infrastructure developments, new infrastructure developments, needs to apply knowledge, needs to build capacity, but extremely important, the awareness raising, the advocacy, the telling the stories, and the overall opportunity to create training programs and exchanges with people. Now, least and not last, um, we have really to consider the fact that there is a need to focus on the most vulnerable and on the most vulnerable countries too, as we heard in terms of experiences, who has been hit uh, disproportionately by COVID-19, as it is the case for all the disasters. Where communication, reach out to media has a vital role to play in informing and triggering action for safe, accessible and resilient health infrastructure. Today, we heard an important reminder from the Prime Minister Modi at the opening of this conference. Nobody is saved until everybody is saved. So thank you for joining this session. Thank you very much for your contribution. Goodbye.
Thank you very much uh, for, uh, for moderating this session, uh, Paula, and thank you, Dr. Vijay Raghavan. Thank you, Kaila. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Hans-Peter. Hans thank you, Garmalia. It was a, a very interesting session with, uh, you know, a wide range of uh, issues connected to resilience of health infrastructure uh, discussed. I personally learned a lot, you know, from the whole issue of, you know, how do we enable scale in systems? How do we become builders of capacity rather than providers of support only? How can we repurpose existing tools? Uh, we heard from Hans-Peter how systems that are long established in commercial delivery uh, can be repurposed, were repurposed in the context of uh, COVID-19. The role of innovation, resilience in a box, uh, very fascinating uh, presentation by Lauren on communication and how visual storytelling can open new horizons and help us address, um, address uh, a lot of the challenges in improving our health systems. Uh, uh, what stays in my mind is a uh, reminder by Hans-Peter that we were not really prepared for COVID-19, despite the fact that we knew that it's, it was coming. If we had invested more in the resilience of supply chains, uh, if we had invested more in that, uh, perhaps we would have had a much stronger response. So that's a lesson to be learned. And uh, a lot of work uh, before us in the coming decades to strengthen the resilience of health infrastructure system. So with that, this uh, session closes. We will start shortly on a very important, very uh, interesting and topical session on the, the, the issue of how do we assess risk at the global level, global risk assessments, how do we develop risk metrics and help countries take a systemic view of risk and take steps to address those risks. So there will be a short break. Um, and then we will transition swiftly to the next session, which I'll introduce in one minute. Thank you very much.